This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 268. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What is going on, everyone? This is Brandon and Mindy, hosts of the Bigger Pockets podcast. Like that, I changed that. <laughs> now we're we're equals today. Uh, anyway, Thank you, here with Brandon, here with nobody. Uh, how's it going, Mindy? <laughs> that, that oh my good. goodness, that was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. So uh, today on the Bigger Pockets podcast, we got kind of a cool interview with a guy named Rich. Uh, we'll invite you know, introduce you to Rich here in just a minute, everybody. Uh, but it's a cool show. Uh, Rich is pretty awesome. Before we get to that, Mindy, what's new in your life? We haven't talked in a while. Um, well, I don't know if you know this, but Bigger Pockets has a new podcast called Bigger Pockets Money, where we do. I've heard. Kind of the same thing, but we focus on money instead of real estate. Although in the, I think we've recorded 10 episodes now, like six of them have real estate ties because real estate is just a really great investment. Real estate is a really good investment. Well, cool. So you That's can awesome. find us on all of your favorite podcast players and also at biggerpockets.com slash money show. That's Very what I've been cool. doing. That sounded like the quick tip, but it's not the quick tip. The actual That's quick not. tip. Quick tip. Quick today. tip. Is very, very quick. If you've not yet done a new member introduction on the Bigger Pockets forum, in other words, introduce yourself to everyone, go to biggerpockets.com slash new member right now. Biggerpockets.com slash new member and fill out your introduction. Let us know who you are and uh, what you're looking to do in real estate. It's a great way to network and to get your name out there. So, biggerpockets.com slash new member. Like that, that is that a, a tip. great tip. And a kind of uh, piggybacking on this is post a picture of yourself. This is a professional yeah, a networking site. Um, we hosted a huge uh, member, uh, yep. what is it? a huge meetup in yep. Denver last year. And it was so nice to see people and they would come in and I'm like, you're Al Williamson from Leading Landlord because I recognized his name, his picture oh, and his, because he has a logo in his pro membership signature. So put a picture go. on your, on your site of you. Um, I know there's a lot of, you know, privacy issues and whatever, but people just come here because they want to talk about real estate. So share who you are. All right. That was a good second quick tip. Quick tip. Quick tip. I like it. Two. All right. Well, Mindy, you want to feel really, you want to feel really bad about yourself right now? I would you're love Denver, to feel and it's really cold, bad but you about wanna, myself. You want to see, you want to see how, how good life is right here? Brandon, yeah, that's right. Look at where that. am I mm. talking to you from? That looks like palm trees. <laughs> they don't have palm trees in Washington. I know. I finally made it to uh, Hawaii. I just had to brag about that. I'm at the Disney Alani Resort right now. Oh. And uh, But not. we're just here for four days, and then I'm going to be staying in, over in uh, Kailua for a few months, so that'll be fun. Oh, so I'll be aloha. Reporting, I'll be reporting live from Kailua the, the next few months of the podcast, so jealous. that'll be fun. Yeah, yeah I'm jealous, anyway. although I will say today <laughs> it's 65 degrees in Denver. <laughs> Okay, fine. Yeah, actually, I can see behind you. It looks pretty nice. So, with that though, we got to get on with this show. Uh, let's 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 bring in Rich. I think that's a good time to do it. Actually, before I do that, I want to say this. Uh, I'm kind of excited. This is nothing related to real estate whatsoever. But Mindy, uh, remember the song I put out recently? Remember <gasps> I the, do the baby one? remember the yeah, baby okay, so, song, which made yeah, me okay, cry. So wait, Thank quick, you. Good, good, good. So, quick backstory, and then we're gonna get on with this. So, um, Seth Mosley, which we had here on the podcast back episode. To, I don't know, in the 200 somewhere. Uh, he's the Grammy winning music producer guy that is also an amazing real estate investor. Anyway, Seth actually invited me out to his studio in Nashville and he recorded a, a song that we wrote together uh, and uh, recorded and it was for my little girl Rosie or about Rosie. Uh, so anyway, I thought it'd be fun. I'm going to th actually throw it at the end of today's podcast. So after the music at the end, uh, I'm going to give it to our editor, Dave, and he's going to upload it there. So if you want to hear the song that I wrote, it's kind of cheesy, but it, you might like it. It's anyway, not cheesy. Just, it's beautiful. It's and also just NS, not say for NSFW, because you're going to cry. Brandon, <laughs> it's, so, it's such a sweet song. Um, and you. also Seth Mosley was on Bigger Pockets episode show 230. So that's biggerpockets.com slash show 230. All right. Well, thanks. Anyway, okay. so yeah, let's go there. I, I just thought it'd be kind of fun to share what I've been working on and kind of a mutual thing with me and Seth. So that's All right, very well, nice. enough about okay. Seth. So He's enough awesome. about but, you. So let's talk about awesome. today's guest. 
Yes, today's guest is awesome also. Today's guest is Rich. Uh, Rich uh, Carey is an awesome dude I've met a couple times uh, through uh, the FinCon conference that I go to every year. Uh, Rich, actually, when I met him, he told me he owned like 20 houses, and he owns them kind of in a unique way that most people don't in that he has no mortgages. But he, he's not like a multi – like he – he he works a very steady normal job called the U.S. military, uh, and <laughs> today he talks about how how was he able to buy twenty houses on a military budget, so to speak. Uh, very very cool stuff. Very applicable for anybody who's uh, you know doesn't make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, just an average American. Oh, and he invests entirely out of not just out of state, out of country. So yeah, so much good stuff. Long yeah. distance real he's, estate investing for yeah, sure. Like and long distance. He's currently in Korea. That's if you yeah. look at a globe, we're like literally halfway across the globe from Korea. Yeah, That's where and he's buying and managing and owning all these things. So very, very cool stuff. So without further ado, let's bring him in. Okay. Rich, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Podcast, man. Good to have you here. Yeah, it's awesome to be here. Yeah, this should be fun. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about your story, but we did get to connect down. Where was it? Dallas? Is that where we, we all? We were in Dallas. Were? Yep, FinCon and San Diego. FinCon, yeah. And San Diego. Oh, yeah. That was my that was my second FinCon for me. Yep. Yes. And there we go. So uh, you you do real estate. That's the that's the word. Anyway. I do real estate. Yeah. Wait, for, wait, wait. For a, a while here. Yep. Aren't you stationed in another part of the world? You can't invest in real estate long distance. It is a little bit harder. So I'm in the military. Uh, I've been in the military for the past 18 years, and currently I'm in Korea. So I'm in so, South Korea uh, right now. Yep. You can't invest in real estate if you're in the military. You can't invest in real estate if you're in Korea. Well, that's the end of the show. Yeah. <laughs> All right. See you later. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. Right. So okay. So what time? What what time is it in? If you're in Korea right now, what, what time is it there? So 5.42 a.m. These are kind of my first words spoken, and I'm just trying to wake up here. And is it nice. Wednesday you today? Coffee, you coffee, you... It is Wednesday. Yeah, ah. Wednesday. Wow. Yeah. We're talking to you from yesterday. Oh. That's right. No, uh, that future. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. We're, I'm in the we're, future. We're yesterday. We're, we're yesterday. yesterday. <laughs> we're in the future. Bro. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, weird. This is All awesome. All right, so from the future, tell us what it's like. What's the weather like in the future? <laughs> All right, so let's talk oh, about your real estate. in the future, yes. <laughs> All right. So how did you get into real estate? Let's talk about your very first deal. Okay. So I was in the military and my first assignment was actually in Guam, which like most people have never heard of, but some small island like out in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific. And I was very eager to get into real estate, but uh, Guam is a place that has typhoons and earthquakes all the time. So I decided uh, I'm not going to buy. So that was in 2000. In 2001, I, or in 2002, I eventually ended up moving to Washington, D.C., and I bought a townhouse in Alexandria, Virginia. And that was just going to be my primary residence. That's like the first house I, I ever uh, moved into. And it was, um, it was $280,000 for a townhouse. And I thought for sure that it was the worst decision of my whole life. I mean, you know, to me, that was like <laughs> way, way, way too much money. Didn't sleep. You know, it was like crazy. I thought for sure I was, you know, ruining my life, but bought the house. Um, did you buy just, that? Was, did you buy that with a traditional it, loan? Were you in the military at the time? Yeah, it was it was pretty typical. I had enough money saved up to put ten percent down, and then I financed financed ten percent at uh, you know seven percent, and then the the rest was um, a five point five thirty year fixed. Okay. Okay. Yep. So you bought this first house. Yep. So I bought that first house and then, uh, you know, I ended up moving away in two years and ended up turning that into a rental. Uh, and that rental, it rented out for about uh, 2000 a month. I had that house for a long time. I sold it in 2016, but it rented out between 2000 and 2400 a month. Uh, as we know from like the, the 1% rule, but that's not like amazing, amazing numbers. Um, but it was a, a decent rental and a way to get my, uh, you know, sort of feet wet. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was a start. I think the thing that sort of got things going for me though, was when I bought in 2003, thinking that that was the worst mistake of my life, it was only about a year later that, that, you know, the, 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 I guess the net worth of the house or the prices in the area shot up. And so it was worth about, you know, 400, 450, two years later. And I wow. realized very quickly, like, I've got to go out and buy more houses like this. You know, I'm, I'm making money. So I, I kept trying to go out and buy more houses. Uh, ended up 
I felt like they were rising so quickly in price that I didn't, but I ended up getting into a couple of other things uh, that we could probably talk about. I ended up flipping new construction, which turned out to be an interesting experience, and uh, later on ended up flipping houses while living in uh, Japan. Okay, yeah, I want to. I Wait, talk about yeah, there's things. like there's a thousand <laughs> things I want to talk about. Yep. I I want to do with the new construction one first because I read that in sure. your yeah. in your uh, application. What do you? What did that look like? Why would you flip? A, I'm assuming you flipped a new build. Did you go in and renovate it? Okay, so, and then I mean, I don't know how often you guys have ran into flipping new construction. Um, Never. But it's not. It's not something. Okay, it's not something <laughs> that I hear. Okay, well that's. It's not something that I, that I hear a lot. And um, the way that flipping new construction works is, first of all, it's something that I'll say right off the bat, I don't think it's a great idea. It's one of those things that everybody does when, <laughs> when, you know, when the uh, markets are skyrocketing and everybody's making money. And you're kind of like, oh, look, everyone's making money. So I'm going to do that. Uh, and what happens is you go to pretty much like this, you know, massive empty lot where houses aren't built yet. And there's just a trailer. There's just like a trailer there. And you go to that trailer and it's got like the little model of what this area is going to look like once everything is built. And you go in and you buy the house before they've started construction on it. But you just put a deposit down and you've bought that house at a set price before they've broken ground yet. And in my case, I was able to buy one of the first houses, one of the first townhouses, and this is near Alexandria, Virginia, in attractive homes that was going to have like, you know, 150 homes. So I'm like number six out of 100 and something. And I'm also uh, an N unit, which is also desirable. You pick all your amenities, you know, how you, you know, when you buy a new house and you get to like pick all the you know, cool sound system and the granite and, and, and do all that fun stuff and the, and the expensive, you know, extra paint and, you know, vault ceilings and all these other fancy things. So you do that. And then the idea is you've locked in your price a year later, it's finished. And since uh, things are still appreciating by the time it comes to market, you just turn around and sell it as new construction to the next guy and you just take that large profit. So you never move into oh. it. Okay. And you're not rehabbing it. You're no, just, no, no. you're just, okay. So I heard about this in Florida right. in like around the same time frame where people were buying these condo buildings that were just going crazy. And then yeah. they had issues in, what was it, 2008, 2009, they were just walking away from them and entire condo right. buildings were built, but nothing. Um, yep. Yep. So how much money did you make on that? So let's see, I think I did this in 2005. And uh, a lot of people had already made money doing it. So I should have known better but I didn't <laughs> and what happened was by the time it was done what I realized was the prices had not gone up they had stayed about the same and I was very nervous and I was like uh oh and so I did two things put my house up for sale and put it up for rent I'm gonna you know I'm gonna try to make money somehow or at least not get in trouble somehow the problem with putting it up for rent there was no takers I couldn't you know, get anywhere near covering the rent except for a couple of offers for Section 8. And the people that wanted to rent for me that were Section 8, they had plenty of money, actually. They had, like, a lot more kids than I wanted to live in the house. They, you know, there, there was, like, they had a lot more children than, than I felt comfortable moving in. But they were going to have plenty of money. And it's something that I looked into. Um, I actually ended up, like, meeting the family. Uh, and not feeling very comfortable with that particular family and decided not to do that. And then uh, what I ended up doing was getting with my real estate agent and offering like a bonus to the seller. I think it was a $3,000 extra bonus to the seller. And I said, look, please help me unload this. You know, I'll take a loss. I'll break even because my original plan was to make, you know, make 50000 or make more. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything. Just get me out of this. They got me out of it and they made about $10,000. But what ended up happening to the rest of the houses in that, in that tract of homes, there wasn't one person in that tract of homes that was planning on living there. Every single person was flipping new construction. Most, wow. of, them, most of them ended up being foreclosed on. Uh, and you know, most people got into a lot of trouble there. Uh, so um, I was lucky. I was lucky to get out of that. And it was a good lesson. Wow. Did you go back and buy yeah, so, any foreclosures? No, I, I mean, I, I mean I, that would have been smart. Um, I was moving on. I moved to Monterey. 
I moved to Monterey, California, which is which was my next assignment. And what I did in Monterey, though, or what I almost did, almost got myself in trouble again. Um, I wasn't. I mean, I couldn't tell that the bubble was bursting. I just knew that that particular purchase didn't work out that well, and I was still kind of riding high from how much money I make on my how I made on my first property when it came to appreciation. So I wanted to do something. I, I wanted to buy another house. I wanted to find a way to make money in real estate. Uh, and I and I didn't really know any other real estate investors yet. I don't know if Bigger Pockets even existed at that time. Uh, I don't know, two thousand and five, six time frame, probably not. It did, and, but not in the current okay, iteration. Very small. Okay. <laughs> and uh, you know, I hadn't met other investors, and I hadn't met this world on the internet or anything. So I was in Monterey, and it was the top of the market for sure. And I went to uh, buy or rent a house, and I was close to buying. And they had convinced me that I um, that I'd found a good deal in Monterey, California, nine hundred thousand dollars for a two bedroom, one bath, right next to the ocean. Whoa! Ooh, and right I was next like, to the ocean, though. Right next to the ocean, and I was, you know, this close to buying it. Kind of pulled out at the last second. I was starting to get money from you know friends and family, and finding a way to make the down payment work, and uh, decided not to do it. Now, a lot of people, while I was at that assignment, I was there for three years, ended up buying a house, maybe not like I, maybe not like right by the beach like me, but maybe inland a few, you know, maybe 30 minutes or an hour. There were a lot of military members, you know, who otherwise had very good credit that ended up walking away from their homes or being in a lot of trouble. Uh, some people that bought in a city called Salinas uh, ended up buying, and then two or three years later, it was worth almost half by the time they left. So that was just a very bad time in the market. Yeah, that was right around so the very we, top. Yeah, it was. Can I ask you real quick about like, you know, people who are listening to this that might be in the military or maybe who just move often. You know, the, the strategy where you move to an area, you buy a house, and then you get shipped to another area and buy a house there. I mean, that's worked really well for some people. Do you recommend that or... Like or not, you know, because you would have been in yeah. trouble there, or is it just because you were looking for the million dollar house on the beach? Yeah. Is that what would have got you in trouble? Oh, I'm really glad you asked that question because I think it's the biggest mistake that people in the military make. I think that everybody in the military knows somebody who has made a lot of money by buying a house at every location that they've lived, or most locations that they've lived, because they probably don't buy one when they, you know, when they're in Guantanamo or something. But most locations they've lived, and then they uh, could, yeah, that right. Might be fun. Yeah. I'd love a place in Cuba. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> um, and then they retire, and then you know, and of course, and maybe it had, you know, maybe the timing was right, and the you know, appreciation was right, and you know, they tell everybody they know, and and hey, you hear about so and so that made a fortune, and because they bought a house at every station. But that's, I believe that that's a rare case. I believe there's luck involved, and. Um, more than not, you're going to see people that got themselves in trouble doing that. Um, I'm somebody who believes that you don't buy a home at a certain location. And I'm the kind of person that doesn't buy a home in the military, spe especially this is the case. You don't buy a home unless the numbers look right for that house to be a rental when you move away. And that's yeah. how I evaluate home sales. And so I'm looking at first at the 1% rule, and then I'm kind of using the 50% rule and, you know, and, and running the numbers, at least at the beginning, am I going to even be close to buy a house around here? And so there's, and I could get to this later, but when I moved to Montgomery, Alabama later in my career, I rented a house in Montgomery, Alabama, but I ended up buying six different houses while I was there, you know, as investment properties, even though I was renting the house that I was living in. And the one I was renting would oh. have made a good, that wouldn't have made a good investment property. The numbers weren't right. Yeah, that's fascinating because, you know, like I think people oftentimes think that you have to own your a house before you can start investing in real estate. In fact, I get that question quite often from people saying, you know, well, I'm renting right now. Should I buy a house for myself first and then buy investment properties? And you could yeah. go that route, but there is no rule. There's no law. There's no even like ethical or like logical reason to do it one way or another. Like, you know, we right. actually had that argument with Grant Cardone back a few months ago here on the show when he was saying, don't buy a house, period just rent and then buy <laughs> rental properties. Right. I know that's the, yeah, and I, I don't think that's horrible advice. I think that there's, there's a strong case to be made there. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, so that's kind of how I feel. I mean, it might be different if you're not in the military and you have a chance of staying in a certain location five or 10 years, 
But if you're in the military, my advice to everybody is going to be don't buy a house unless you're living in a house that you've already ran the numbers on and already determined that that house is going to be a great rental once you leave. Like you've yeah. bought, actually it, bought it to be a rental. That's fantastic advice for anybody who's looking to buy a house. I mean, unless you're like yes. rich enough to not care. And if you lose a bunch of money, who cares or whatever. But like, generally speaking, if you're going to buy a house, yeah, every house I've ever purchased, I've looked at it and said, could I rent this out and at least break even if not make some money as a rental? Because I know that I'm not going to stay there forever. I don't think I've ever stayed yeah. in the house more than three years. Right. Like, and if the market sucks, well, I'm going to have to rent it. I'm not going to sell it. And that's yeah. what it is. So. Yeah. yeah, that's an Good excellent advice. piece of advice. So you're not, I want to clarify, you're not saying don't buy property. You're saying don't buy property until you have run it, run the numbers as a rental. Don't get yeah. in, don't get stuck with a house that isn't going to work as a rental. That's really, really great advice. I love that. Uh, you mentioned that you flipped houses in Japan from, yeah. ja from <laughs> Japan where, yeah. where the houses weren't located in Japan. No. Okay. How do Tell you do that? that? Yeah, how do you so, do that? So the way I did this, first of all, like I'm not handy. I don't understand. I don't walk into houses and like, you know, know how to tear things down and remodel and all that. So I was a partner in this deal. I was the I guess the money or the finance financing behind the deal. When I was in when I was in um when I was in Alexandria, um kind of one of my neighbors there. He was my neighbor, ended up becoming my sort of property manager for the Alexandria, Virginia house that I owned. And he was a real estate agent and we ended up partnering up. I used to, I used to drive, he used to kind of drive me around every time I was um, visiting Alexandria, Virginia in the hopes that for me, it was the hopes that I would find another investment property uh, in DC to purchase. And he was, he was a real estate agent. And eventually <clears throat> I couldn't find a deal that I was happy with. And he said, Rich, I flip houses like with partners. Um, but like, I'm sorry, I'm like tapped out financially, but I have more deals than I know what to do with. He says, you know, if you want, I mean, I'll, you know, I'll flip the house. I just need you to put the house in your name. And, uh, you know, we're just going to split everything 50, 50. And he said, and I'm, what I'm doing is I'm flipping houses in our neighborhood, like where your, where our townhouse is. He lived across the street from the townhouse that I owned. And he said, and he says, I'm keeping the the property, you know, values up in our own neighborhood. Like, you know, with I'm buying like the worst houses, the foreclosures, and we're fixing them up to make them the best houses in the neighborhood. And then, you know, we're selling them. And I really liked that idea. And actually, so did everybody else in the neighborhood. Um, but I'll admit, though, scared to death. I was scared to death that this guy was going to take my money and somehow like, you know, move, you know, move to the Philippines. I mean, I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I mean, I knew him, but being in Japan and having have somebody like go into your house and gut it and, you know, you see all these bills coming back and forth and emails and, you know, sign this, sign that. I was scared to death. Uh, but I, I, but I, I like him. I liked him. He, you know, we worked together on a lot of things. I knew him from the neighborhood. He uh, had a great reputation. So we flipped a house together. Uh, I think a lot of the details on my flips are on my website, but I believe the first house that we flipped made about $18,000 profit. I, mean, okay. I didn't do anything. I mean, all I did was buy the house, uh, wait a few months and sell the house and take a check. That's like all the work I did. Um, and we did that, I think, six times over the course of a few years. And we, I made good money doing it. And uh, it ended up being a very good partnership. But I, I'll admit, though, that's like, I mean, I looked at the deals with him and we talked about them, but really it was his expertise and my money. And uh, I'll also caveat this by saying made a decent amount of money, you know, put some money in my pocket to, to do future things in real estate. Um, it's pretty speculative. I mean, I made money, but, you know, I could have lost money just as easy. I stopped doing it because I was happy with the amount of money I was making and some of my deals lost money. I didn't want to start losing money and I didn't want to lose big because he felt like he was stepping up. I mean, I think he's doing three, $4 million deals now. He was stepping up and uh, I wasn't ready to step up with him because I wasn't there and I wasn't that comfortable not being involved more deeply in the deal when there was that much money at stake. And so, uh, and, and I, I eventually found a new opportunity in Montgomery, Alabama, 
where I was purchasing houses there that I felt, uh, you know, were had good cash flow. And I kind of wanted to take my money and move it to that opportunity instead. So, so that's my experience flipping houses. So how did you write your partnership so that you were protected? Did you have a first position lien or you said you had the property um, in your name? I guess, I mean, for my, first of all, I guess I didn't necessarily like, we didn't have an, a lawyer do anything fancy. It, I don't, I don't really know if he was really that protected, but what, what happened was I owned the house. So the house was always in my name. So I don't, I guess if you look at it kind of logically, I don't think that I was ever not really protected. I owned it in my name and then he used all of his own money to uh, pay for the construction, you know, to pay for the remodel. So he had his own money into it. I guess what could have That's happened great. is, yeah, I guess what could have happened is, I suppose that I could have sold it and like not paid him back. Um, I suppose that would have been a possibility. I went, I went over lots of different possibilities in my head and it didn't seem like, to be honest, there were that many ways that we could screw each other over. Um, You'd be surprised. The, well, and I think, okay. <laughs> I think, well, as I say, I think this is what like, what I like about how you set this up and a lot of people don't look at partnerships this way is like it. You were both invested in the deal really well. Like you both had skin in the game. We're not gonna. Yeah. A lot of people come to a deal and they're like, "Okay, I want you, you know, partner to buy the deal, and I want you to fund the deal, and I want it to be in your name, and I want you to do all this stuff, and I want to have no risk on my part. You're gonna do everything." Yeah, like, that's. And that's I a scary get fifty percent of the deal, or I get. I saw and I get 50% a thread. Of the deal, yeah. There was a thread yesterday in the forums. I want sixty eight percent of the deal for <laughs> literally doing just what you said. I found the deal and I need somebody to bring everything in. So no, that mm -hmm, doesn't mm -hmm. that doesn't yeah. work that way. Um Yeah. I mean you might find you might get lucky and find somebody who was willing to do it, who trusts you enough because they invested in you as a person, as a character, but like that's really hard. Like you got to figure out what can you bring to the table? I mean, even if that means you're the guy in there swinging the hammer, like I, think yeah. I mean, like that's what I did. I had other people bring the money, but I swung the hammer. Now today I bring other people in, but I'm running other parts of it. I'm managing the property or whatever, but yep. yeah, to me, people just want their cake and eat it too. And it's, it's tough. Right. Yeah. So let's move to those, uh, mobile Alabama properties. You said you bought okay. six there. How many do you currently own in mobile? Okay, so it's actually Montgomery, Alabama. Oh, Montgomery. I'm sorry. Yep. That's my... it's, Mo it's Montgomery, Alabama, and I bought six in the 10 months that I lived there. And then I moved away and uh, lived in um, Stuttgart, Germany for the, for the following three years. And then I purchased uh, – I can't do the math. I purchased enough to have 20, right? So what is that? Uh, 14, 14 more. more? 14. 14 more, yep. I purchased 14 more. And then to clarify what I have exactly, I have 20, but I have two in my uh, wife's IRA and I have two in my IRA. And then the rest exists uh, in an LLC that we have. And so that's how we own all they, of our, That's how we own all Are they of all there in Alabama? All of my houses are in Montgomery, Alabama. Yes. Okay. Okay. And do you have and any then, other ties what? there besides you just moved there once? Yeah, that, I was going to yep, ask the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... What happened was, yeah, that, I don't have any other ties there. Uh, I, I had one assignment there. I was there just for a military school that a lot of uh, military officers, a lot of Air Force officers end up going to. And I was there for 10 months. Um, and while I was there, I just ended up meeting another you know, military officer who had been there for a few years already. And he said that he already owned four properties and that they were cash flowing well. And that at this rate, you know, he was going like, you know, to be able to retire early. And that really like struck a curb with me. Like, wait a second, what are you talking about? Because I had the one, I had the one rental property just in, in Alexandria, Virginia, that wasn't really like, it wasn't really cash flowing that well. And I was still, you know, looking very hard for another opportunity. And um, so I kind of, you know, was very excited when he said that he had found something in Montgomery, Alabama, because I did not move to Montgomery, Alabama thinking that that was going to be the place where I was going to buy houses. Alabama's an affordable place. What are yeah. you paying for these, or what did you pay for these properties? Um, I was paying, yeah, ish. The first property I bought, which, um, and I know I've heard, I've heard you guys talk about this on your show a lot. Their first property is your throwaway property or, you know, your learning property. 
Um, my first property, I paid 30000 for it. And um, I think the first six properties, which were by far my best purchases, just because of the timing, between 30000 and 45000 for those first six. And then the remaining ones, uh, I've paid uh, between probably 40000 and 60000 for all the remaining ones. You paid between thirty and forty for the first six properties, and then between forty and sixty for the remaining fourteen. Is that because they were appreciating, or were you buying in a different neighborhood? I think that the t- the time period that I was there, um, that year that I was there when I bought six, happened to be just an amazing time to buy. So they were appreciating. Once I left, they were going up in value, and I think it was one of those things where it was a it was a too good to be true thing. And while I was there, I was hesitant. I was hesitant to buy faster. I mean, I could have bought 10. I could have probably bought 15. And I, we haven't gotten into this yet, but I was paying cash for these. I wasn't, I wasn't using loans. I mean, I could have bought a lot more. Um, but I was worried. I mean, I was kind of like, what if, you know, what if, um, what if the tenants are going to crash the place? What if the market dies here? What if the military base closes? You know, like, what if things just don't work out? Like, I did not know what to expect. I was new to all of this. Um, So once I left and I had like an income coming in for about a year, I realized that I was making a lot of money from these rentals and that um, I should have bought a lot more. (laughs) And so I and then I just kept buying. So I'm going to jump in here real quick. I'm wondering about the, the military base fear. Well, yeah. Before we go any further, uh, so, so I'm looking at a deal right now, actually, um, that's in a military town in Arizona. I'm doing uh, putting together a deal, and uh, it's in a it's in an area where the primary employer is the military, and so that's the that's the biggest fear I have with it is what if the military leaves? What if the you know the government shuts down spending? How do you overcome that fear? Do you overcome that? How do how should people look at that kind of a situation? Again, totally selfish question, but oh, you know, the military is um, all over. You got to look at it. First of all, um, again, we haven't gotten into the side of things yet. I'm sure we're going to talk about it soon be- because I believe that it is unusual that I don't use any debt and that all my houses are paid off, you know, and yeah. that people are always telling me like, well, what's wrong with you? You're going to make more money if you use debt, you know, and you, in the long run, you'd have a, a bigger net worth if you did. I could tell you one thing, though, is if if I have all my houses paid off in Montgomery, Alabama, and there are two, there are two um, military bases there. If the those bases were to shut down, if they were just to come out on you know the list of bases that were closing, uh, that would be really bad for anybody who owned twenty houses there. Okay. In my case, I think that I mean I I'll just be be guessing, but I'm guessing that rents would go down. I don't know, thirty percent. That's just a guess. Thirty thirty percent. That's a guess. Um, and I think that my vacancies would go up a lot too. I don't, you know, they'd go up from like, I don't know, eight or 10% to like 20%. In my case though, that would not be catastrophic. I would not default, you know, I would not lose my homes. I would be annoyed. I would, it it would be less money for me each month. It would bother me. Now, if I was highly leveraged, if I had, you know, used one property to finance the next and pulled the money out and been highly, you know, highly leveraged in the deals, I could lose it all, you know, with the military moving out of my town. And so, and I, and of course you could just, you could be somewhere in the middle, right? You could have a certain amount of equity and have a certain cushion where you could absorb something like that. It's almost like when the market fell out, right? In 2008, could people absorb that or not? I think if your military base moved away, you would be experiencing something like that only in your town. And you'd have to be able to absorb that. Um, and you'd have to have enough equity to do so and cash reserves to do so. And I think that's how I would look at it. And, and hopefully you, ha- you have like friends in the military, right, that are sitting on the right committees at the Pentagon. And you'd have a, head- <laughs> and you'd have a heads up on something like that. So uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll check for it. I do. I do have that. I do. I have a lot of friends that are running the uh, military, you know. (laughs) So this question comes up in the forums a lot. I hope that's a helpful answer. At least that's my two. It was. It was very it was very helpful. Like be more conservative. That's a great answer. Yeah. And this question comes up a lot in the forums. Should I highly leverage or should I pay off all my properties? And I think it comes down to what makes you comfortable. If you are leveraged to the hilt and you can't sleep at night, then that's not a good investment. If you are 
you know, totally cash paid off. How much money do you need to live? Do you need a billion dollars every month coming in? No. So if you know your numbers and you know, you know, what you need to, to make this work, pay off what you want and leverage what you want. And it's what, it's what you can sleep with at night. Yeah, true. I, I, I mean, I think for me, you know, I've got 20 houses that are paid off and I'm going to, and I'm going to, I'm planning on retiring, uh, or as a good chance I'll retire at the 20 year point, which is, uh, you know, just two years away from me. I'm going to have a retirement that's, you know, roughly an extra 3,500 a month after taxes on top of the, you know, income that I'm getting from my rental properties. That's enough for most people. Um, it should be. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's it's plenty right now now if i if not I enough stay, for me if i want to stay if i want to stay at the disney resort in oahu every time i go though i might you need, need, I might need to start i might need to start leveraging property you might need a, yeah and, and uh and to be quite honest with you i i'm considering doing that i mean i have no debt i have zero debt of any kind and um i'm around a group of people now you know I, and i've been around these people for a while now who are doing bigger deals, you know, and better deals and more complicated deals. And, you know, and of course, everybody's using debt to do this. Um, when I'm back in the States and when I have it, and, and I don't even have to be in the States to do this, but I think I'll just feel better when I am. I may put a little more time into this. I may decide, even though I've quit my normal, you know, nine to five, you know, paycheck job, I may decide that I want to get into using debt uh, you know, to get into some of these bigger deals and increase my cash flow. But for now, I'm very happy where I am. And that's yeah, what you I need think to that be. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it is. And, it, and I think like Mindy said, it is a lot about like, can you sleep at well at night? But I would even expand like, you know, back in 07, like everyone thought they I mean, everyone's sleeping great because in their in their heads, right? The market right. was always going up back in 06 and 07, yeah. right? So everyone's like, I'm it getting never went so down. rich. Yeah. It never goes down. Yeah. And, you know, like, the way I look at uh, the, the the leverage thing, and I, not that you asked my opinion, but I'll give it anyway. Like, <laughs> I want to be conservative in everything that I do. That's why I do what I call Burr investing, which is where I buy fixer uppers, and I want to build a massive amount of equity, usually twenty to thirty, at, at least twenty, but hopefully thirty percent equity in any property. That mm -hmm. way, I have that cushion in case something goes wrong. Uh, at least a thirty percent cushion. If the market dropped thirty percent, I'd be all right. Even if it went under. Every property I buy has to have cash flow as well. That's a requirement. I want good cash flow, right? Yeah. So that's how I look at it. Um, you know, and some people that's not conservative enough. Some people that's way more conservative. They're buying stuff at you know break even point because they think the market's going to keep going. And who knows? But right. I, I would I would rather like I would rather make less money in my future but be more secure than be the guy that leveraged the hilt and made more money with the you know a thirty percent risk of losing it all. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Can you sleep oh. at night, Brandon? Except when your baby falls I out sleep. of the bed. <laughs> yeah, except for when my baby falls out of the bed. Yeah, so the uh, true story, This I told Mindy and Rich this right before we recorded. But yeah, this morning, so we're at the Disney Alani Resort on Oahu right now. Uh, and uh, my they have two queen beds. I hate hotel rooms that have two queen beds because then like, I don't know, it's weird. Like, where do you put the baby? So she's in the bed, right? And mm -hmm. she's 18 months old. Anyway, so we woke up at 4.55 this morning with a thud and then wailing <laughs> and screaming as... <laughs> Rosie woke up very rudely with meeting the floor with her face. But, you know, no permanent damage that I can see. So I'm anyway. sorry. I'm not laughing at her. I'm thinking of the many times that my kids fell out of the bed and yeah. woke yeah. us all up with a big thud. Uh, let's get back to Rich because this is not the Mindy and Brandon show. This is the Rich show. <laughs> could be. Um, it, it could be, but it's not. It's Rich's show. Uh, Rich, you said you're not financing these. How are you getting $30,000? to put down on these houses and, and yeah. $40,000 and $60,000. And yeah. this is, this right. is another question That's why that people the military have. doesn't pay, you know, a million dollars a year. I'll, it's not the I most lucrative that. career <laughs> choice. So, yeah. you know, and I've True. got, I've got a lot of these people in the forums. I, that sounds rude. There are many members in the forums who <laughs> ask the same question. How do I get started investing with no money? And well, I, if you don't have money, how do you get money? So rich, how do you get money? Okay, so you, you guys have had Doug Norman on the show, right? You've had Doug Norman, who's in the military. We've not actually. We've not, and I, I would like you to had get Doug him on. You haven't? Okay. No, I've All asked right. him. No, we should though, because he's got a real estate deal. He's he's my surfing oh, okay. guru. You haven't had him on. All right. So I was so anyway. I'm you know, but you you, I'm kind of a member of this whole like fire community, you know, and the, the choose fi, you know, the whole like 
you know, be frugal and save your money and put it in index funds. I and, uh, know what you're talking about. Right. right. Okay. Not so everybody what's in this fire, conversation. What does FIRE stand for, by the way? Can you, for those who don't financial, know? Financial know. independence, retire early, right? And so sort of on top of, uh, you know, being a real estate person, I'm also kind of a, a finance nerd. Before I came into the military, I also worked for, uh, I worked for Fidelity Investments as a stockbroker. Uh, interestingly enough, I technically still work for them. I'm on a military leave of absence. Uh, <laughs> for 18 years? Stretched out a little bit longer than they, than they expected, I think. Uh, they, they call me every two or three years and ask me what's going on, and I send them my new military orders, and they're kind of like, okay, you know. So, so anyway, um, but um, the kind of the the the... I think I lost my, where was I going with this? Help me. How Sorry. are you getting money? Uh, where do you, do you find this money? money? All right. You're How in this fire community. Money? Right. So I'm in the fire community and I've been very frugal my entire career. I've been a big saver and, and, and a big investor. And the things that I invest in are pretty, pretty basic. I mean, I put my money in the S&P 500 index fund, right? Like that's, that's what I do. I don't play with stocks. I don't, you know, I don't play games with, with charts and, you know, craziness like that. I've always been very frugal, and another thing that I that I do or did that is uh, unusual is I uh, paid off my primary mortgage on that um, two hundred eighty thousand dollar townhouse in Alexandria, Virginia. I paid that off in six years, so I had you know that paid free and clear, which also brought in additional cash flow once it was paid off. How did you pay and that off for, in six years? I just. I guess that's a good question because that's because that's what everybody would ask. Um, first of all, the money from flipping the houses was going into paying that off. Okay. Um, but also, well, let me think about that. No, it was paid off before. It was paid off before I flipped houses. What I did with that was, um, again, putting money into the index funds. That that money was growing at the time and it was making good money. And I was just like taking all of my extra money. Again, people in the fire community. Fire, the financial independence retire early community, a lot of times they'll try to live off of less than 50%, you know, of what they're making. And we were definitely doing that. Um, we were living on, you know, quite a bit less and put all the rest into investments. And in, in my case, it wasn't, we weren't investing yet. We were just paying off our mortgage. So we're the kind of people that, you know, don't buy new cars, you know, don't take fancy vacations, don't buy fancy, you know, nice furniture, don't buy Gucci bags, right? We don't do what our friends are doing. We don't go out to dinner that often. We don't go out drinking. When we go to restaurants, which is rare, we don't get appetizers. We don't get dessert. We don't get alcohol. All of this money is going into paying my mortgage off. All of it is. Um, you surprised? And then my wife was working uh, an, an extra job too. Or she, when she was in D.C., she was working as well. We just paid it off. I mean, people don't think it's possible. It is. You can pay off a mortgage pretty fast when you when you sort of put all your effort into that. Right. And um, you're making additional principal payments. Yeah. yeah. Which, um, so for people who don't know what that means, your mortgage payment is constructed of principal interest taxes and insurance, and you're making additional principal payments, which reduces the amount of interest that you owe, which yeah. is a great way to pay it off if you are of the pay it off mindset. I am right. not. I like having um, a loan on my house because I have all that money to then play with. Um, and we're actually refinancing to take more money out so we can play with it. But again, it's something that makes me sleep at night. I can cover my mortgage payment, so it's not a big deal. Right. So I paid this, I paid this loan off and that, that gave me, you know, I mean, I own the house free and clear. And then after I had it paid off, I have more money coming in every month. I have a larger portion. I, mean, I wasn't making very much money on this rental with the mortgage of sixteen hundred a month because I was only getting about twenty four hundred. Um, but once it's paid off, I'm making a lot more. And then um, I'm also putting my money into investments now. By the time I get to uh, Montgomery, Alabama, I've got a decent amount of money in investments and money saved up and money from flips. And so I was able to buy those six houses in cash with that money. And then when I realized how much, how well this was going financially for me, and, and how you know great a market this was for rentals, I decided to double down on it, and that I just better keep doing this. And so even though I moved, you know, I was moving away, I was setting up a system so that when I left, no matter where I moved in the world, I'd be able to keep buying here, 
and I put my house on the market in DC so that I could have all of that cash to just keep buying there. Okay. And that's kind of, that's what I did. $260,000 oh, it, it, gets you a lot of houses. Well, no, well, it was, it, yeah, but it was, four, it was, four, oh, it was 400,000. That oh, point. that's right. You said that. Oh, that gives you even more houses yeah. at 440,000. That's yeah. like 10 houses right there. That's exactly. It's, wow. it's 10. And now the other thing too, that I like to note is when I first bought that house in, in, uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, it shot up to about $450,000 in less than two years. And I felt like the smartest guy in the whole world, right? I was, I was brilliant. I'm a brilliant, you know, real estate investor. But if you You're think a about genius. it, I'm a genius. But if you think about it, <laughs> I sold that house. I don't know how many years later, 2003 to 2016. For four hundred thousand dollars, I sold it in 2016. If you do the math, it didn't really make that much money in that period of time, from uh, 200, 280 to 400. The fact that it didn't really grow again after that two-year jump. I mean, the appreciation wasn't really that great when you spread it out over that time frame. So appreciation can be pretty amazing in those spurts if you know that that's when you should sell. But uh, over the long term, it turned out not being that great. In fact, that amount of money in the market would have done a lot better. Now, you could also argue that that amount of money with leverage you know, would have done better as well. Yeah. Well, what I, what I love about the, this whole thing is like, I mean – so I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan. I like Dave Ramsey a lot for a lot of things. I mean, he's he's militant against debt uh, yeah. on real estate, and I I tend to go a lot more into leverage. But yeah. like generally speaking, like especially from a budget standpoint, like when you live conservatively and you don't go and spend lavishly, like I mean, I, I'm always amazed at people like who make twenty thousand dollars a year and they're broke, and then they make forty and they're broke, <clears> and then they make eighty thousand a year and they're broke, and every. Yeah. Almost every American lives paycheck to paycheck, no matter how much you make, twenty to a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, I know a guy that's making two hundred and fifty, two hundred and eighty, or something like that last year, and he's broke. Like he's consistently broke and has no money, <laughs> lives paycheck to paycheck. Right. And I wonder why. And I go to I go to dinner. I went to dinner with him, and he bought like a four hundred dollar bottle of wine for dinner. And I'm like, that's crazy to me, you know? But then again, people look at me. I'm sitting at the Disney resort where I paid $400 a night for this hotel for four nights, right? So people think that's crazy for me, right? So like everyone just lives to their – not everyone, but most people live to their limits. So I love the fact that you said, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, this is where I'm going to draw that line. Uh, to put a couple plugs in here real quick, first of all, Dave Ramsey's book, uh, Total Money Makeover. Uh, I have no affiliation with it. I think it was fantastic. It helped yeah. Completely changed my mindset about money and finances and budgeting. Uh, it's amazing what you can live on, like in a, in a small amount when you yeah. focus on it. Right? You've seen mm -hmm. that. Right. Um, and it's Scott amazing. Trench wrote, go ahead. It's amazing yeah. what you don't miss when you give it up. Like, oh, oh I could true. never live without fill in the blank, and then you try to live without it, and you're like, oh, you know what? I don't really miss that so much. There's, yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah. and so, food. Yes. <laughs> Who needs food? So Scott Trench wrote a book called Set for Life, which is also uh, very much like in that fire community sort of thing. Like, how do you mm -hmm. live on half your income or less than half, or like even less, you know? And, and Scott talks about a lot of different strategies in there. So if you guys want to pick up that, go to biggerpockets.com slash set for life, S-E-T-F-O-R-L-I-F-E. -E. Uh, and then, I don't remember, there's something else in there. But, um, oh, David Green. Yeah, he wrote a book recently on long-distance investing. It's called Long Distance Real Estate Investing. Hey, Mindy's got a picture of it on the screen. I do. Uh, that uh, has a ton of tact, uh, uh, tips and tactics for how to invest at a long distance. Things that I'm sure Rich has done, which I want to get into here next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but last thing I want to I point out is you did not invest in, you did not buy 20 houses free clear in a year or in two years. Like, this is a career that you built over time. Right. So like I think people oftentimes will listen to a show like this and go 20 houses free and clear. There's no way I could do that. Right. But like it started with one purchase. It started with right. a $280,000 house and then being consistent. It to did. It, it did. I mean, and I, I think the, I mean, even though I think the 20 houses I bought, I think they might have been purchased in about a period of two years that that wouldn't have been possible without having bought the $280,000 house at the beginning and then paying it off and then having that cash to use later. So that's kind of what made that possible. And then all the experience that I got along the way, I flipped the new construction, which didn't go that well. I flipped houses, which I made money on, but I lost money on sometimes, uh, you know, and on my, you know, on my first property in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, I had like a lot of, you know, from my perspective, I've heard worse stories on your podcast, but I had like a lot of, a lot of ba really bad things happen to me 
on that house that, you know, some people would have said, forget this. I'm not investing anymore. You know, well, I want to know about what bad things happened to you. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not <laughs> gleefully <laughs> delighting in your, your tragedy, yeah. but you know, what I've right. heard a lot is that having these mistakes shared really helps you learn. I mean, every real estate investor I know has gone through the school of hard knocks and everybody again is going to go through the school of hard knocks. But what did, what, what are the, like, what's the worst thing that happened? So I, I guess when you, when I compare it to what's happened to other people, they're not that bad, but when it's, when it's happening to you and it's like, it's your the money, end of the world. It's like, Oh my God. So when I bought the first house, um, again, I'm just, I'm not experienced. And, and the people that, that were sort of, they were kind of helping me. There were other people that were kind of holding my hand through this process. And they, you know, kind of like they helped me find, you know, the real estate agent that I should use and the property manager and kind of like when I was, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know who to use to fix the, who do I fix, you know, fix the AC. Oh, well, you can try this guy. Well, but I still kind of felt on my own at times and I was buying the first house and did the walkthrough Used, the guy that I used for the inspection, you know, he he came in and he inspected the house, and I got you know like the report, and I looked through it, and we closed. And then when we start, when I walked in and started like clean, you know, cleaning up and looking around, there was a big pile of trash in the middle of one of the rooms, just a big pile of trash in the middle of like a kind of an add-on room. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of weird that they left this trash in the middle of the room, but I'll clean it up. And when I moved it, what I realized was that. There was a huge bump in the floor, okay, like two feet high. Somehow they'd put the trash there to cover up the fact yes. that there was like a huge protrusion in the floor. And the, <laughs> and the carpet had come up like almost two feet in the middle of the room. And this wasn't caught by the inspector. Because the and, trash was there. Uh, they won't it, move it, anything. It, it was It was like, it was like a, a oh, if I remember right, it was a Christmas tree, like a Christmas tree just like laying down on top of it or something. <laughs> and it was like, you know, it was like July or something. So, so and, and like some, just some random trash. So yeah, there's just a, a large kind of like camel's hump in the middle of the room. <laughs> and you know, nobody knows why. <laughs> and I was, to say that I was freaked out was like, you know, I'm just like, okay, What's going on with this house? What did I buy? Like, how, you know, what is this going to cost to fix? 10,000, 20,000? Like, I had no idea. I bought the house for 30,000. I had no idea what it would cost to fix. And I think the hard part was over the, maybe the course of the next two weeks, having different people come over, lots of different people, and getting numbers between, you know, five and $20,000 of their estimate to fix whatever is wrong with this. And, and the, and the tricky part was like nobody was going in and like figuring out what was wrong. They were just like guessing what was wrong and giving me random estimates. Eventually, somebody came along, took out a sledgehammer, peeled back the carpet, smashed it. I mean, just like right in front of me, just like smashed <laughs> it, started like pulling back concrete and they like pulled up some large root. And he's like, oh, it's a root from a tree. And he's like, oh. <laughs> He's like, I'll, uh, you know, I'll report the concrete and do this and that. He's like a thousand bucks and we sh should be good. And I'm like, oh, a thousand bucks. Like, you know, I can live with that. <laughs> but that was like a two week process. What also happened later was um, the house was vacant for a while. Once it was finished, it took a while, a little while to rent out. Um, again, this is all due to inexperience. And um, when somebody, when, when the tenants finally moved in and they went to turn the uh, uh, water on, I got a phone call that the water was running into the front yard and that something was wrong and there was no water running in the house. And so I sent the plumber over and the plumber called me up and said, somebody came and stole all the copper plumbing out from under the house. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> and so I think that was about a $2,500 fix. It was a $2,500 to rewire all the plumbing from out and under the house. Um, oh man. And so this is kind of my, you know, this is my start to real estate investing. I think I also spent two thousand dollars. This is a this is a cat lady house, Ugh. and so there was a, um, the, the house smelled like cat piss, and <laughs> it had like these hardwood floors under the um, carpet that I thought would look really nice. You know, get rid of the carpet and like let's make the uh, hardwood floors look nice. But I kind of overdid it. I spent twenty twenty two hundred dollars, kind of like refinishing the hardwood floors. And it ended up look, looking like the govern, governor's mansion, right? Like I didn't, need to do, I didn't need to do that. I mean, I found out later you could spend like 200 bucks doing this. Oh. I spent like 
two. I you know I had like six six coats of like wax on it or something. I mean, I just I didn't know what I was doing. I spent way too much money getting this uh, house. I think I spent like I don't know fifteen thousand. You know. Put putting into it instead of the you know probably the you know five thousand I could have put into this house, so that was my first house. And the, there were a few other small things, but um, I remember my wife saying like, "Well, you know, I guess that's it. You're probably you're probably done investing." And I'm like, "No," I'm like, <laughs> I'm like "We're gonna put we're gonna put two more offers in. I'm gonna put two more offers in. I want to buy two more right now." And she's like, "Seriously, we're gonna keep going?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And both and then and both of the next two houses ended up being excellent buys. To make up for that <laughs> copper pipe thing. Yeah. That is yeah. soul crushing. Yeah. <laughs> I had copper. I actually uh, my husband walked in on the guy who was stealing the copper, so he only got that's a small different. amount. <laughs> but and he so he walked in and the guy was in the basement stealing copper and he ran out the basement door. And then Carl was like, why is there water on the floor of the basement? Like we had moved out and we were getting ready to sell it. And that is soul crushing. Even if you get like four pipes gone, it's just like, I feel so violated that somebody was in my house, even though it's not even my house anymore because I'm moving. So yeah, Yeah, I can imagine. And kudos to you for recovering from that because that is really like, I just bought this house and somebody stole all the copper. That's a big deal. Yep. Yep. And you know, you're like, you're worried about trying to make the numbers work and, uh, you know, and these mistakes you're making keep piling up and you're like, well, you know, I mean, you're like, geez, what am I doing? You know, I'm no good at this. I'll never make it. I'll never make it as an investor. You know, and you're doubting yourself and, and like, and you're also thinking like, if this is happening now and this happens every time I buy a house, how am I going to make money? Well, guess what? It hasn't happened every house. Those have been the exceptions. I had a problem with squirrels once. I had squirrels got into the house, and that ended up being kind of expensive, getting rid of the squirrels. But stuff like that has been kind of the exception and, and not the rule. And even with eviction, well, I, yeah, more of the exception than the rule. What I find is that it kind of averages out. Like if you own one rental property, you might just get a luck of the, you know, the luck of the draw and you get a really crappy one. Or you might have a big problem like they steal copper pipes. But when you have 10, 20, 30, you know, properties, they kind of just average out. You have a few problems here and there, but mostly they work all right. right. Uh, it's actually a really good reason why a person should go bigger and not just put all their eggs into one rental property. Right, and if right. you can buy a, a bunch, it yeah, it, it averages out and it's not too bad. I think people hear the horror stories oftentimes, but they're fun to tell, but they don't happen that often. No, it's true. And I, I think what you said about, about having several properties, uh, it's very true. I, I found that to be important for vacancies. I mean, if you have all your eggs in one basket for, you have one property, right? And it's got like a mortgage on it and you have a very small cash flow. If that happens to be vacant for four or five months, that could be very painful for you. You know, you're yeah. coming out of pocket to pay that mortgage for four or five months in a row. If you've got 20 properties, there is almost zero chance that 20 properties are going to be vacant at the same time, <laughs> you know, for four or five months. And if and if they are, you're in big trouble. So yeah, that's something I like about having several properties. The one thing that cool. makes so, me okay. sad about your story is that you didn't have a place to go where you could discuss this with other real estate investors who had that's, this experience no, and could have given yeah, you <laughs> some encouragement. <laughs> it's it's too bad a place doesn't exist like that. I wish, the, I wish there were one, and I, I can't think of any off the top of my head right now, <laughs> except for the you know, actual form I'm speaking you know, in at the moment, which oh. I guess is biggerpockets.com. Oh. Yes. Thanks for the wow. plug. I've heard of right. that site. Wow. Good job. Yeah. All right. So I want to know, but before we get out of here um, and get to the fire round stuff, I want to know, like, how are you currently managing your properties? I'm assuming you have a property manager, right? Yes. So how do you, like, what... And I'm talking again. This is a selfish question because I got you know out of state properties now. So how how much do you do with this? How much interaction? How often should, do you call your property manager? How much do you just let it ride? How much do you rely on just the computer printout that you get from whatever their management software is? Kind of can you walk us through your your current management? Yeah. So so I'm managing from so I'm managing from out of state, right? And in my case, from out of country. And I knew I was going to do that. In my case, it's a little more unique because I lived in the place. I lived in the place for a short time where, you know, I had the properties, but then I knew I was leaving. And I also knew I was going to add a bunch more properties. So I kind of set up my management company kind of for that situation. And what I mean by that is I spoke to my management company about 
um, adding properties to uh, you know my existing six, and what I and what I told them that I needed from them, which is unusual, um, is that I said, you know, what would really help is that I'd like you guys to be involved in the make ready, and I mean the make ready is usually like just painting, you know, painting and getting it ready for the next move in, and I said. I want to keep adding properties and these properties are going to need work. Like, I, I, you know, I want to buy properties that, you know, I can add value to, right. That are kind of, you know, maybe they have termite damage or maybe they're, you know, they're tore up by the last tenant or whatever, whatever it may be, need, need a remodel of the kitchen and the, and the uh, bathrooms. But that's going to require some supervision and, you know, a decent amount of construction and remodeling. I need you guys to be involved in that. I need you guys to supervise that work and be involved in that. And they're kind of like, well, we don't do that. Like, that's not what we do. We, we want to get this stuff from, from you, like, moving ready. And I said, I know, but I'm going to buy, like, a bunch more properties. And, you know, if if you can do this for me, you know, I'm going to go from, like, six to at least ten, maybe more, uh, you know. And I'm going to – this is my plan to, to make this, like, a lot bigger. And they were very reluctant, but I said, let's just try one and see how it goes. And I kind of talked them into that. So um, that's been very helpful. I mean, I was gone. You know, I was in I was in Germany and I, I ended up buying some houses that needed a lot of work. They ended up supervising the work then and they have all the contacts. They, you know, they have contractors that work for them, I think, very cheap. And they just add on 10 percent onto that price and pass it on to me. I'm totally happy with that. And that's kind of how we worked everything is that they acted as, you know, in that role for me, in addition to being my property manager. Um, and also I built up a lot of trust with them uh, in the time that I was there with them, just realizing that they're a very good property management company that's trustworthy and, you know, cares about, you know, saving money and not, you know, not ripping me off and all that. Um, so that that relationship with the property manager, me being gone, is extremely important, and the the trust is is kind of what's key, I guess I would say. Does that answer your question, or do you want me to clarify? It does. Else? Yeah, no, no trust good. is key. It is, and I like that you have the managing your rehab stuff. Uh, I actually found similar that property managers that I've known tend to have better contacts with the the contractors, better relationships, better con contacts, better prices. Then I can get like, I mean, most contractors in my area now are telling me 50, 60, $70 an hour for like brand new handyman. And I'm like, I'm not going to pay you $70 right. an hour to go and, you know, but I, they, they're still doing 25 bucks an hour or whatever for my property manager. And mm -hmm. so I'm finding actually way cheaper going just through my property, even with that fee. Like, anyway, that's a, it's a good point. So oh, that one, cool. more thing I want, one more thing. Yeah, if, go ahead. If you don't mind, one more thing I wanted to bring up Please. too is, you know, if you're trying to do this from afar and you're having problems with your property manager, problems with your real estate agent. Um, I found that, you know, I've fired property managers. I fired two property managers, uh, not in, in Montgomery, Alabama, but in, in, um, Alexandria, Virginia, and I've fired real estate agents. I think that's something you have to do as a, um, you know, real estate investor is you have to, when you start seeing problems with the service you're getting from a real estate agent, you know, who you're trying to use to, to buy properties for you or from a property manager, if you're not seeing like, if they're, you know, if you're not seeing the numbers that you should be seeing or you're not getting, you know, they're not answering the phone, they're taking too long to rent properties out, like any of those things, you need to have like really good communication with them. Let them know what the problem is and give them a chance to correct it. And if they're not correcting it, you need to figure out, you need to like take your business somewhere else or, you know, I mean, that's probably what you have to do. Take your business somewhere else. You've got to fix the problem. Don't be afraid to tell people what you need from them. They're making money off of you. Don't be afraid to fire them and like move on to somebody else. Cause I mean, this is your business. This is your livelihood. You can't afford to waste time. Exactly. Yeah. Give them the opportunity to make yeah. the change. And then if they're not making the change, they don't want your business. So don't give it to them. There you go. All right. Well, let's uh, actually last question before we move to the fire round. W what do you see your future? You mentioned earlier, you were thinking about retiring maybe in a few years. Yeah. Uh, do you plan on buying more wait until the market crashes? What's your, what's your thought? All right. So I totally don't believe in the, you know, wait till the market crashes thing that everybody likes to talk about. I mean, I'm just going to keep investing as makes sense based on what I see around me. Um, yeah. If the market crashes and I can, I think that's hard to see when you're like actually in a market crash. It's hard to know where you are in a crash until I get, I agree. You're several years away from it and you're like, Oh, if I would have bought then I'd be rich. But, um, but if I can see that, I mean, if, I guess if I can, 
based on my experience of been having been through a few cycles in life, if we're in a crash and it's seeable, if that's a word, uh, I suppose I'll uh, you know try to get in and do some purchases. But I think I sort of brought it up earlier. Um, I'm at the point now where I was very comfortable with these paid off properties and I kind of felt like, yeah, this is enough. But um, as I get more exposed to other real estate investors, um, I kind of have this feeling that after retirement, what I want to do, I'm sorry I made you yawn. I, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I woke up really early I'm today. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm trying what, to hide. Maybe it. falling out of bed for you too. <laughs> um, you know, I want to. I, I want to do more with real estate. Uh, I have my 20 paid-off properties, and uh, it's enough to live off of. I'll be comfortable, um, but I want to scale up. I want to find a way to invest. I'll probably find a way to invest out of state. You know, um, and um, get into some bigger deals. You know. Find a way to do multifamily. Find a way to partner up with some people. Uh, that's in my future, and I find and I and I want to do all of this part time. How much of that is for money, and how much of that is just because it's fun to be in real estate? <laughs> that's I would a great say question. it's I would say it's probably ninety percent of the fact that it's just fun. I mean, I love this, and I've loved this since I was a kid. My my grandfather uh, was a general superintendent. He was in charge of these large jobs, you know, of homes, or he, he he would he would build them all. He wasn't the guy that like owned them, but he was the guy that was in charge of building all of them. And uh, I loved walking these tractive homes with him when I was a kid, and even when I was older, I just loved it. And I remember thinking as like a ten year old, I remember thinking in California as a ten year old, boy. I wish I could buy a house right now because imagine what it would be worth when I was 18 years old. And that's what I thought when I was a kid. Um, yeah. I just love real estate. You know, this stuff is fun for me. Well, neither of us know what me you're too. talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I always, I always say like, I mean, like, I mean, I, I don't know. I've always, I said, no matter what, I will buy real estate because I just enjoy it. You know, I just think it's a, it's a fun thing. So very cool. And actually one of these questions actually that you talked about relates to the first fire round question I'm going to ask you in a minute. So let's get to the world famous fire round. Fire. It's time for the fire round. All right. Today's fire round questions come direct from the bigger pockets forums. As always, uh, you can get to the forums by going to biggerpockets.com slash forums. They're fantastic. I owe all of my success to them, or at least a good chunk of them. So uh, let's help out some people from the forums, Rich. Uh, number yeah. one, uh, somebody said, and this is actually very related to what you just said. They said, I want to wait for the next big buying opportunity. Oh, I don't yeah. think I'm going to have to wait more than a couple of years. Uh, you know, am I just being pessimistic? What do you think? I shortened that question. It was a long okay, one. Okay, yeah. That's they want to wait for the I, next buying opportunity. All yeah. right. I'll tell you that, uh, and this this is uh, me as a real estate investor, and it's also me as a, let's say, also a, an investor in the sense that I'm a stockbroker and someone who's read all those books as well. I just don't believe in that mentality. I don't believe that you wait for things to crash and then go in and invest everything. There's deals to be had all the time. Just look look at your investments like right now. You might have to go somewhere else and I'll I'll go ahead and plug that like other book for you. Where is it? Where's that other book? <laughs> the David the, the the long distance real estate investment. I listened video. to that podcast and it's it's also it, he, he there's a lot of similarities between what what me and yep. him uh, do. Uh, the way that he leverages uh, the different people on his team. Um, you know, you don't you don't need to wait until things drop in your area to buy. Find out where prices are good. Find some people you trust in that area and like make it happen, you know, buy a house there and go for it. That, that's my advice. Okay. I love Perfect. talking about leases. Um, we are in the middle of getting, I'm, I've been reading leases for all 50 states and Washington, D.C. Um, because we are starting to make these available to our members. We uh, sell leases at uh, biggerpockets.com slash LL forms. Um, yep. we're, we're Mindy, adding all the states. Was that a, was that a plug? No, awesome. that was a recommendation. Wow. If you need a lease, I can wow. help you out. Uh, wow. Mindy approved. Way to plug. We don't plug on this show, Mindy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So what LL are forms. Your, okay. LL forms. What are your favorite add-ons to, to add to your lease? Do you have an addendum to your standard residential lease? Okay. So, 
luckily I have, I mean, I have a management company, right? And right. so they pretty much handle all the lease stuff. Um, and I guess one of the things that about leases that I think was important to me is like, I'm not a huge fan of pets. And so for me, it's pets, for me, pets, like I'm willing to maybe wait longer to not, to, to, to not have pets in the house. But I mean, this is, this is kind of a personal thing. Um, but, I, but there's been a lot of cases where, and this is, and again, this goes with like the benefit of having a management company that you like trust and know a lot of times they'll come to me and they'll say, and, and this goes to many different addendums. They'll say, look, you know, in this particular case, we think that you should let this family, let's say, have a dog. They have this type of dog and we think it's fine and we're going to put that into the lease and sign it. Um, I'm going off of this management company's like, you know, 10, 15 years of experience and making an exception to something that I normally feel, for, normally feel comfortable with. But I guess my point is I tend to go with my um, management company's experience in cases like that, not knowing a lot about leases myself. Okay, that's fair. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. All right, next one comes uh, from Gerald King. He says, hey, everyone, I've been pulling my hair out, not literally, trying to figure out where to get started with building my business. I'm based in L.A., originally from Bakersfield, which I visit often. My biggest problem right now is choosing a market and being able to afford the marketing costs. I've been researching and hearing to do so many things. Some say get a website, business card. The other one says don't waste your time on that. Go focus on deals. From what I've heard, direct mail is a good way to get started, but it's expensive because it takes such a massive volume. Uh, I've got a budget of $500 a month. Anyone in LA or other big cities have advice or input on what's working for them? What do you think he should do? So he's talking about getting started just in real estate, doing something in real estate? Yeah, getting started. Exactly. Yeah. Expensive okay. market, not a lot of budget for advertising, needs to find some deals, but it's an expensive market. So it's hard to find them. Well, I can tell you that, um, you know, I mean, I was, I've been successful with direct marketing myself. I mean, uh, in the way that I did it was, you know, I did the mailing, we did the mailings ourselves at home. We, um, and I got a 11 and a seven year old and we, you know, I did up the letter myself, you know, and, and uh, signed them all myself, you know, like folded it up, put them in envelopes, mailed them out to the people. And I just like used a website where I just kind of like pulled all the three bedrooms, two baths in the areas that I like in Montgomery, Alabama, you know, got the address list, address list, hand wrote them on, which I believe, you know, helps. I think that helps like people want to open up the letter. We hand wrote the yep. address, put like a normal stamp on it, came from like a normal person. And we've sent that out five or six times, and I've I've bought a few houses that way, uh, and it's kind of and I just kind of explained who I was. It was like rich, you know, and I used to live in the area, you know, I, I was in the military, and it was very effective, and I think it was very cheap, and I got some really good deals doing that. Perfect, I like it. I do too. All right, last question, Mindy. Right, I I started, then you, then me. Yes. Yeah, last, last question. question. <laughs> I am new to bigger pockets. My question is that I'm starting out with no investments anywhere. Should I get a loan for a home to house hack or should my first investment be in or should my first investment be in a rental? Okay, house so house hacking or straight rental. Or straight rental. Right? Yep. I love house hacking, right? I mean, I I think house <laughs> hacking is great. House hacking is I wish I could have done it myself. I think sometimes I, mean, I think you can do it if you have a family, but if you're, if you can pull off a house hack, like that is the way to go. And I think, I know even for people that are in the military, I believe that with a VA loan, which is available to people in the military, you're able to get a multi-unit property with your VA loan. So you can get a duplex, I think you can get even a three or a fourplex with a VA loan. And turn that into an awesome house hack. But if you can find a way to do that conventionally or whatever in your personal situation is, house hacking as you know the way to start off, where you're there to manage the second or third and fourth property kind of next door to you, is absolutely the way to go. That's isn't that what uh, is his name Scott Trench? Isn't that what he did? Yep. That's what he does. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's awesome stuff. Yeah. That it is. That's you I just build hacking. so much equity so quickly if you are yeah. into paying off your property you build yep. so much money i mean you can scott paid nothing to live he was yeah. getting uh i think his mortgage yep. and in the the place that he was in he had an fha loan his first payment was like 1500 and he was bringing in 
1850 or 2000 or something. So it wasn't super cash flowing, but he was paying nothing. He was living for free. Yep. I think Paula Pant is kind of a popular real estate blogger who is, who's done yep. house hacking and she did very well. Kind of the same thing. If you do it right, you live for free. But even if you don't quite get the numbers that great, you're still subsidizing what you're living yep. for and you're living on site to take care of things. So I love it. Yeah. It's a great, great investment cool. choice. If you can. Yeah, my very first rental was a was a duplex, and I just moved out, and then I kept it as a rental. I still have it today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, I paid that property off recently because I wanted just more. I, in fact, I've paid off three properties. Yeah, yeah, something year. cool. Yeah. People paying things off. So it does <laughs> happen. Like, yeah. So it does it happen. Does happen. Besides me. Well, okay. like to, to, you know, we didn't. We I didn't. I didn't go into it a lot there, but yeah, basically, I I am paying my properties off right now. I'm actively trying to pay my property off, and yeah. kind of following the Dave Ramsey like debt snowball. Like as I as I pay off more properties, I now have more cash flow, which then I can then pay off more properties, which then I get more cash flow. And I'm trying to knock out everything over the next 10 years. So by the time I'm right. 40, roughly, I'll have 100 units that so I have almost 100 units right now. I'll have everything paid off in 10 years from now. It's kind of my plan. Right. And 100 units paid off should be plenty to survive. Like, one, well one thing on. I wanted to explain about my properties being paid off is like when I had six properties that were paid off. It didn't take too long. It might have been a year. Like it took like a year for those six properties. I think it was a year, maybe longer, fourteen months, to purchase a seventh. So six cash flow yeah. properties could purchase a seventh. But now that when you have twenty, it only takes five months for twenty properties to purchase a twenty-first property. So there is definitely a huge snowball effect that happens. It's kind of like almost the same as compound interest, but with houses. Yep. Yeah. Love compound it. cash flow. Somebody tried a book called Real Estate Snowball. That's a good idea. Ooh. I'm going to do it. Now, Rich, you can do it. Rich, write it down. Real Estate Snowball. All right. All right, let's get out of here and get over to the last segment of the show, which we lovingly refer to as our Famous Four. Wow, that was really flat. All right, these are the same. That was really flat. These are the, <laughs> these are the same four questions we ask every guest every week. And uh, let's see uh, what you got to say. Number one, what? what is your favorite real estate related book? Real estate related. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. Heard that. it's yeah, a that's... huge cop. It's a huge cop out, but it's because I think it was the first. It was the first book to talk about it. Rich Dad Poor Dad, right? And it, yeah. and, it, and, it, and it's because it wasn't just real estate. It was. Uh, it's because it was a mindset for money and a way to think about. You know, money shouldn't. Uh, you shouldn't work for money. Money should work for you. That applies to investments, but that also applies to real estate. And, and that's why I love that book. It's, Me too. It's a book that is, it, what is that, the most recommended book on our uh, on our podcast? I'm sorry, on say, your podcast. I would say it is, which made me not want to pick it, but, that, but that's my favorite. If it's your favorite, right. it's your favorite. It's the most uh, recommended book for a reason. Yeah. Okay. But I got another one that I'm curious how much you guys have heard, so ask Ooh. away. Okay. Right. Is it a real estate book? No, no, no. I'm talking oh, okay. about what the next question next you're going to ask. Oh, okay. Let you... What is your favorite business book? Fooled by Randomness by Nassim Taleb. Do you, oh, have you ever on, heard of that? But I've not read it. Okay. Fooled by Random. Ran... Fooled by Randomness. And really, it's just about, it's about chance and how we really, I think how people kind of overestimate uh, the role of chance in our lives. And I think it has, and I think his whole premise has a lot to do with, uh, like Wall Street, the fact that there are people in Wall Street that make their money, you know, predicting what the market's going to do, you know, and uh, the fact that you, a lot of people will pay people money to, uh, you know, invest their money for them, and I think he would pretty much argue that all of that is totally useless. You know, nobody can predict where the market's going. Nobody can tell which direction direction stocks are going in. But he doesn't apply it just to that. He applies it to many different facets of life. It's the most fascinating uh, book I've ever read and had a, a large influence in the, in the way that I look at money. Oh, great. Oh, super cool. Yeah, I got to check that book I, out. Highly recommend it, yeah. Uh, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do when you're not doing real estate? So when I moved, when I moved to um, Japan and my son turned – five i taught myself i already could ski but i taught myself and my son how to snowboard and i kind of haven't uh, stopped with that you know we just keep snowboarding and uh unfortunately when he was about nine he surpassed me in skill which is kind of scary 
But when we, we moved to Germany, again, benefits of being in the military, moved to Germany and got to do some really cool um, snowboarding there, like in the Swiss Alps and, you know, in Italy and Germany. Um, and we're going to try that out here pretty soon in, in Korea. So that's a, that's a big hobby of mine. I'm a big runner. I love, uh, love watching movies, love reading books, love real estate. Um, I kind of love this whole FinCon community, which I think you're, you're both involved in. That's something that kind of came into my life about two years ago. And then, uh, I started up a, like a little blog and that's kind of become a hobby for me as well. I think it's not fair that your name is Rich <laughs> when you talk about money. What's, That's right. What's the name of your blog? So my blog's name is richonmoney.com, which I think nice. is a – I'm happy with I that I think that's name. fun. That's a great name. <laughs> I have fun with it. I, I was worried about finding a name and, and happy when I found it. That's awesome. All right. So my last question of the day, what do you believe sets apart successful real estate investors from all those who give up? they fail or they never get started. I think I told my story that, that I kind of wanted to tell to illustrate the point. And that was, uh, it's, it's working through, it's, it's getting past fear. You've got to work through the fear that you have. You've got to not let it stop you from, uh, you know, continuing, um, that sort of fear of failure. And then recognizing that you, you're going to see tough things are going to come up. You're going to have things that scare you. You're going to have things that are unexpected. And instead of letting that cripple you and stop you, you need to have this attitude of, I have so many resources out there. Like I'm going to plug your, I'm going to plug bigger pockets. You've got bigger pockets. You've got friends, yes. you know, you've got websites, you've got books, figure it out, get past it and get onto your next deal. Love it. Yeah, Love that, it. That's great. Uh, where can people find out more about you? So I think you kind of just helped me plug my website, which I appreciate. <laughs> www, www.richonmoney.com. And then I'll just give out my, uh, my Gmail uh, email address, uh, uh, richcary, R-I-C-H-C-A-R-E-Y, richcary at gmail.com is also where you can reach me by email. And it's just, I just have a, a, a blog where I kind of blog about um, what I'm doing with real estate. And it's, uh, it's a hobby. And um, come take a look at it. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. All right, Rich. Well, this was, yeah, this was fantastic, Rich. Like, I don't know, there's a ton of good stuff in here. So thank you very, very much for coming on here. And uh, yeah, I look forward to kind of seeing the next phase of your life as you do so much fun, some fun real estate. So hey, thanks for having me on. Today. This this is huge for me. Uh, this is an amazing podcast. So I really appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you so much. Hey. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. All right, that was our interview with Rich Carey. That was awesome. Uh, I really, really like that guy a lot. Every time I talk to him, like I feel like I'm, I don't know, I learn and I'm inspired to go do a better job at my real estate because he's he's a good investor. He's a good investor, and he's a generally or a genuinely nice person. He is. He's, I agree. He's not snarky at all, and th that was no. a that was a great show. <laughs> yeah, unlike yeah, some you know, people. I, yeah, you, <laughs> like I've been telling you about how like I, you know I, I pay off a few properties. Like he's actually one of the inspirations for that. When I was talking to him at FinCon, and he was talking about that, I just kept thinking like how nice that sounds not to have a bunch of mortgages. Even though yeah, I know mathematically it's you know you, you make more return when you have leverage, and I get all that completely. But just like this peace of mind to have them paid off. I'm thinking 10 years from now, if I can have them all paid off and be 40, well, 42, uh, and have them all paid off, that sounds pretty nice. So anyway, that uh, would be really thank you, nice. Rich, for inspiring me to tackle some of that uh, mortgage debt. And uh, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, like I said earlier, that's a big question in the forums. And it is, you know, question. it's it's what you're comfortable with. There is no right or yep. wrong answer. So There is no right or wrong answer. Okay. Well, huge thanks to Rich for coming on and sharing his story with us. Yeah. Well, let's get out of here. Uh, I got to go do some beach stuff because, you know, Hawaii. So. Okay. Well, I'm going to go do some work stuff because, you know, job. But you enjoy <laughs> you enjoy your life, Brandon. You do you. And uh, I will. I will have you know, I was up at 5 a.m. this morning writing because people at Bigger Pockets need to know the truth about real estate. So I yes, write they do. the truth. So. Well, thank you for saving but the But you world, know what? That's Brandon. the beauty. So this is actually the beauty of, li uh, of living, uh, temporarily anyway, in Hawaii is that, like, I like by noon, it's like three o'clock Denver time, five o'clock, right? Like East coast time. Is that right? Yeah. So like, it's like crazy. Like, so like 
I can be done by like noon and then like the rest of the world's kind of retiring anyway. So like I can, you know, it's 1215 right now. I'm going to go hang out at a beach. Well, it's 315. So I am going to say for biggerpockets.com, <laughs> this is Mindy Jensen signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. Hey, Rosie. What are you doing? This is Rosie Louise Turner. She is five hours old, exactly. And she's about ready to get her first bath. So many years has hurt me We had all but given up On turning two of us to three Missing you and wishing For the sound of little feet Praying someday We'd meet Then one day we got the news That before another year We'd need to decorate a room And carry you home carefully But between me and you I didn't yet be Till I heard your heartbeat And everything just changed My heartbeat would never be the same At last I knew the sound of peace When I heard your heartbeat And everything about me changed My world was open wide that day Every dream I had came true Pink and roses fill the corner of your room and everywhere To feel you move and pray for you completely unaware That nothing could compare Suddenly something was wrong Rush your mama to the doctor I was crying out to God Please don't take my little girl She's right where she belongs Tell me is she still there? Then I heard your heartbeat And everything just changed My heartbeat would never be the same At last I knew the sound of peace When I heard your heartbeat And everything about me changed My world was open wide that day Every dream I had came true Silently you lay across my arms so peacefully Little hands and bigger plans I'm thanking God that He has given you to me As I listen to your heartbeat Everything has changed My heartbeat will never be the same At last I know the sound of peace Cause when I heard your heartbeat Everything about me changed My world was open wide